Morning, Ab. Morning, Clay. How are we? You good, bud? That's the story. So this morning, I've got this special tip for shooting stainless steel nails into the weatherboards, and it's a bit of a um, a tricky, tricky thing. But what I want to do is I want to be able to repeat the same position for the weatherboards, and I want the nails to go the same depth. And doing it by hand doesn't actually do it as well as it does when you do it with a gun. Right. So these are the nails I have. They're stainless steel. They've got ribs on them. And that little colour in there is, like I've said before, it's like almost a coating they give that generates a little bit of heat and glues itself in to the timber. I've got a full round head. They're not a D head or anything. And they're exactly 65 mils. They're what we want to um, bang the weatherboards in. These aren't the profile that we're going to use on your house. It's okay. got a little rebate in it, but these are the samples they gave me. And I've just been trying to set up the gun to get the right depth. And as you can see, I've given it a machine gun. It looks like it was um, yeah. Al Capone. Yeah, Those nails. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I um, take my usual tip off, which is for framing, which has got all these things in it so that it doesn't slide when you put it on an angle and bangs a big nail in. Right. And then this tip goes on. Now this tip's got a rubber bumper. It's called a no mar tip, so I don't leave any marks on the timber. Oh, okay. And it's got a depth. Ah, depth set right. so I get it consistently at the right depth and the weatherboard has to go the nail has to go right through there right. above that weatherboard and what that does is it allows it to grow with the weather so and it should not go between the two because it will split the one below so you always just nail a weatherboard with one nail right and it's right just above like probably four or five mil from the outside of the nail clear from the other one down below and, and then these two grooves which aren't on this case, these two grooves, yep. capillary grooves match up and the idea is any water that goes up, comes up, tries to go in there, can't go up the gap so that stops it from going up. Okay. So, so that's how they work. So they're governed, your whole distance of cover is governed by that where that groove has to be. So that's got to be right there. So this is for instance 112 mils cover right. is what I get from these weatherboards. Okay. So yeah, I've just got to set the gun up and um, Into make it. sure I'm happy with it. And these guys have sent me some sample nails and I'll give them a call. I'm happy with the nail now. I think it looks good. I was a bit concerned about it. I've just had to rejig re the depth of it. I've got to make it as shallow as possible because it was going too far down. And what I want it to do ideally is to sit just on the surface is what I want. Right. That's so what you want like that, yeah, yep. because I have to nail it on an angle upwards. So if this is the wall, the nails have to go up on an angle like that right. so that the water doesn't track down. If you nail it flat, then the water can track down theoretically right. into yep. the timber. And it can happen when it's in the summer when the boards are dry and you could say there could be a, I don't know, 20 micron gap around the nail because when they're wet it's tight and when it's dry it's a bit less, that's timber for you. And then the water can run into the stud work, that's what the building code right. says. So okay. when you nail it, you nail it on an angle up like that. That's interesting and I you yeah. know, guess there's a lot of home handymen who've done that incorrectly over the years. That's right, they'll nail it almost perpendicular to the top thinking it's like, well, and logically it kind of works that way but there's another stage in the logic and that is that the water can track down the nail. Yeah. Look, the fact is it doesn't mean they've got to go and re-nail their whole house because the reality is how many mils of water are going to track down that nail over how many years. Mm. But what happens is nowadays we know the answers to everything. We know exactly what we can do to make it as good as it can be. Yeah. So we just go, well, we'll just make it as good as it can be. So you nail it up. It's sweet. So this is the cladding that's just arriving. I don't know how we're going to squeeze it down here because it's a pretty big truck and a pretty narrow driveway. Not a lot of room. Bloody good, nice work. So this is all our uh, weatherboard arriving, cedar. And this is done by Arbs. Is it your brother-in-law that makes this Arb? Yeah, my sister and brother-in-law, they machine it. They machine it? Yeah. Yeah, it'll make a handy, handy cover until we get a chance to use it. Pass it down, bro. Trays, well, they do. These are the weatherboards. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Good side of the, the timber has basically been burnt by the machining. Right. So what happens is it's not ideal for taking the stain. It doesn't allow it to go in as deep because it's basically almost like it's been burnt off so it doesn't soak in as well. So the bandsaw face is the face that allows the stain to soak in. Right. And that's what we need for protection. We need it penetration. Yep. Sweet. So is that lintel going up the first job? Yeah. Yep. Sweet. Are you not worried about getting a splinter in your hand without gloves doing that job? Oh no, not too much. Yep. No. It's um it's pretty predictable. Right. So I can sort of watch what's going on. Ooh, you More okay? about what's going on in my face. Yeah, you okay? Yeah, that's yeah. no, light. It's very light, light scantily nothing. Just nailed it. Very small nails. Right. Yeah. Just it tap it in there between. They've done quite a neat job actually. I've put a little block in here and there, and mm. it's all red lead primer on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. It's all red lead, so can't use that stuff nowadays. Uh, the, the primer of choice. This is good firewood, this sort of stuff. Is it okay to burn it with the uh, lead on it? No, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. No. But unfortunately, it is good firewood per se, you know? Yeah, right. Dry. Yeah. You can see, it's really dry. Yeah. Yeah. I've got primer on. I mean, I'm presuming it's red lead primer because what happened was maybe even not quite orange enough, but they stopped putting the lead in the paint quite a while ago. Right. I'd have to Google it to find out to be sure, but it was probably around about the 60s. Yeah. And they still made it red. So yeah. because everyone thought of primer as being right. red, you know. So it may not be. Then. It may not actually have to be red lead. Yeah. yeah. But um, for what it's worth. Not worth risking it, yeah. Right. Bang all those nails off before I throw them over. Yep. So that they duck, ducks walking around and everything's walking around here. Watch out. This morning there's hopefully a bigger change now. What I'm going to do, my intention is to wrap the building and then to put the final amount of bats in there in front of the plywood, then wrap the whole thing. I have to put some little blocks up between the rafters so that I can get my last weatherboard when I'm up there. And I'm just checking finally my bottom weatherboard, it's distance down the overhang that I get on it. And then when I wrap it, I have to wrap all the paper into the doors and I have to tape the top corners of the door and tape the whole sill. Yesterday I got it all level for the sill flashing to go on, so then today I'll put the sill flashing on. Maybe I might put the two weatherboards below before I put the sill flashing on, but I kind of know where they start so I can put it on and have it the right distance out. And then I can effectively put in the doors. So that's the aim. If I got one door in today, well, I would be good. That'd be good. Yeah. Awesome up. Magic. Awesome. My two little dogs are down here and they've just flushed a cat. I think it's got kittens. Be come! Please come! I just heard a meow. Just heard a noise. Be come! Please come! I don't want them having a fight with the cat. I'll pose over. What's she looking at? Oh, it's gone up the tree here. Leave it! 
Leave it, Pace. Leave it. Leave it. They've got a tree that goes up in there. Wild cat. Leave it. Leave it, Poe. Don't touch. It's a wild cat. Leave it. Don't touch. Pace, come. Some of you might be thinking, oh, why don't you just get your dogs to get it and kill it because it's a wild cat. But I don't want the dogs, first of all, getting into that habit, even though they do kill cats all the time around here. But I really want to just keep them on the target species, which is wild pig. Poe's killed a couple of cats in the last, uh, I don't know, last couple of months, wild ones that come along here, and they live along all those bushes and that. And the cats do terrible problems, like they terrible stuff to all the, the native species we've got here, you know, native ducks that lay all their ducklings along here, the little scalps, and the fantails, and the wax eyes, and everything, it's, they, they kill a shitload of birds, and also native insects like wetter and that, but I would rather line my 22 up and just wait when that cat comes out to get a rabbit in the evening and head shoot it cleanly and have my dogs risk getting their eyes scratched and just making a, you know, a horrible bloody mess of a, of a kitten can die a cleaner death than that even though it's very natural I don't uh, think it's uh, the slowest death they grab the cat they give it a very quick shake and it's all over in about three seconds that cat's been living there for a while I knew it was down there Oh what a beautiful morning Oh what a beautiful day I got a beautiful feeling Everything's going my way It's smoko time with Ab And what's today's message Ab? Don't be disturbed by the chatter in your head That's a good message bro, I like that We've just been talking about the chatter in our minds and I said you know I love the thoughts that I have they're not all great, but you know, some of them are fucking stupid, actually. But I love, I love thinking about stuff and like creating what's going to happen next, and I get excited about it. And just recently, I bought a mountain bike, and it's a really weird thing. People say that material things, you know, don't bring you happiness. Bullshit! I fucking love my mountain bike, and I'll be excited about it. Like thinking about it every day. I'm going to go for a ride after my coffee, and I just love it. It really amps me up, and it adds quality to my life, man. So. So, you know, material things, yeah, nah, I, I'm a material person. Call me shallow, but I fucking love that bike, man. It's like an extension of my body. It was one that R put me onto, and I've only ever had crap mountain bikes. It's the first new mountain bike I've ever had. It's just awesome, eh, bro? It just makes you faster straight away when oh, you're on new mountain bike. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, bloody good. Poetry. So, so what about the chatter on your mind? So how do you deal if you want to go to sleep at night and you're like excited about something or thinking about something and you just want to turn it off? What's your trick? Well, it's very hard. I had it last night, actually. Did you? Mm. And um, so I follow my breath, usually. That's the one, man. That's the one. That's the one. If you can't sleep, follow your breath every time. If I've got a uh, uh, anxiety, I'm anxious about something, like it's a problem I can't solve and that will cause me anxiety. If I've got a problem, like just how the fuck am I going to pay this? Where am I going to get the money from? You know, like money can cause anxiety. I don't let it generally, but if it, it's getting really, really tight with things, particularly as I lost a lot of work with COVID-19, you know, I would be up at night problem solving. How am I going to get this to pay that? And then I think, hold on a minute, I'll, I'll face this again in the morning, eh? Because I need to sleep right now. It's two thirty in the morning. This is a dumb time to be yeah, problem yeah. solving. Yeah. Can't so ask anyone anything. You can't. No. So what I do is just what Arb said. I concentrate on my breathing. And what I do is I do, I do. Uh, count like I'll do like 10 seconds in slowly 10 seconds out slowly I'll do it four times and then I'll stop doing that that will still me like 10 seconds in 10 seconds out and then I will just let my breath go in and out and I'll focus on that and you'll drift into sleep eh? every time the thoughts stop yeah well it allows you to separate from your thoughts too so that's the beauty of it is then you follow your breath and you don't follow the thoughts so yeah. instead of concentrating on the anxious thoughts or the, I'm building it right now in my head thoughts or shit it's going to be great tomorrow <laughs> you know yeah. all those things that you don't actually have at the moment all you have is bed so when you just follow your breath it just tends to make you go to sleep easier it becomes a rhythmic thing yeah it's a um the buddhist monks use it as a vipassana meditation that's what they do to allow their thoughts not to be involved in their meditation 
because it's a bit like watching a movie. If you don't see the credits at the end of the movie, you're always playing a role in the movie. But I don't have my own personal experience with a meditation retreat. So it was three days, total silence, yoga and breath meditation. But I actually saw for the first time in my life the credits roll. Really? And it was really quite interesting because at that point it was like, okay, I'm not actually in my thoughts. I'm not, I have them, but I'm not actually my thoughts. Right. They're just thoughts that happen. And you don't act on every thought you have, because if you did... Oh, I'd be in jail for murder. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Fuck you. you know, what, yeah. what did you cut me off for? It's a fucking merging lane, you dick. You, you know. <laughs> that happened when I was younger, more so yeah. than now. I, I remember, bro. I remember you losing it. You were pretty chill these days. Yeah, yeah we were yeah. pretty fiery young men, eh? Yeah, well, actually, the meditation retreat helped my anger. Because Whoa. what happened was I saw the credits at the end of the anger movie. And then I thought, oh... So if I want to follow the thoughts, I can follow the thoughts. But now that I've realized that when I've sat there quietly fuming, because mm -hmm. I've had to sit quietly for three days and I didn't have the keys to the car to get out of there, at the end of the third day, I got the credits finally come down. It was like, I see. You don't have to identify with your thoughts. You don't have to follow them. You just watch them like a yeah. bit of a movie. And then if you don't want to watch it anymore, you turn it off. And it's not as easy as that, but I had to do three days of silence to actually really? get to that point. You, you're not talking for three days? Not talking for three days. Well, that was okay. the hardest thing. That's what mm. made this thing just go off. And But it was a really, um, it was a revolutionary for me because actually my anger after that, I could see the movie playing itself when I was angry and then all of a sudden I'd go, oh, I actually don't want to feel like this. I'm all tight. I'm all fucked up. Mm. I actually don't want to feel like this. And So then I'd just let it go. And now I still get, ah, oh, fuck this with certain things, but mm. it's just gone. Yes. It's like completely cool. different. Yeah. So that was my experience to find it, you know, it's like, and I, I was, it was hard. And if I had the keys to the car, I would have left after the second day. Really? Yeah. I just, but I, so I had to put up with a real stress going on, but then it was clear after that, like there was a bit of clarity and that's cool. and that stuck with me ever since. I've done a couple more of those retreats. I did a five day at one time. Wow. And you did one of them where we did it, it was a Buddhist center. So we did a bit of chanting and it was like quite a rhythmic sort of almost hypnotic thing you know which mm. was quite interesting yeah and um i don't really do religion as a form of religion possibly religiousness i possibly do or spirituality but yeah. religion is a thing i don't but um it was interesting just what it showed me about my mind and about the chatter so now the chatter is something that i can hook into yeah or i can let go of sometimes right you know cool mountain bike ride and i've come home and holy shit this guy hasn't messed around is this done in like three hours probably yeah about that tell us what's going on bro well so it's building wrap on the top the paper and this is um i insulated the bats in this area too so the bats are in there this is basically goes in behind the weatherboards and theoretically if any rain comes in behind the weatherboards they run down here the rain runs away right. so it actually waterproofs the timber which oh, is yeah. why it's called dry stoke Okay. And we have little things for like wires to come out, you know, special things, stick it on. And we stick tape all the way around the doorway. We go the whole way around the doorway. And what I've done here is they've given me a flashing, a sill flashing. So what I did was I made the, I sealed under the sill flashing first. And then I glue the sill flashing down with polyurethane glue, screw it down with stainless screws. I've got the door sitting on it to hold it in its right position with weight. And then I've resealed with the tape a second time down the side into the flashing. Right. So that the water that gets behind the door goes down into the flashing and the flashing empties out below the door. Gotcha. So it goes out. Mm. And if any water comes in past that in any other way, it also still goes down the protected side and it still ends up going out. That's the, the theory behind the whole thing. Now is just, there's a belt as well as braces, you know. So yeah, the doors are in loosely at this stage. What I'll do when I come back tomorrow that glue would have been sealed, that polyurethane sealant. Then I'll just pop the door out and I'll stick some more polyurethane sealant. I run it in this direction so that the water can still run out in right. water. So this is the back of the flashing you see. So it's basically forms like a pond. So I'll put some more bits through there. That sticks the bottom of the door down. It sticks to the aluminium. Right. That sticks it down. I don't drill or screw through the bottom at all. I only screw through the sides and through the top. Okay. And then, um, yeah, then I'll just fit them with packers in between. Then I'll put a little foam backing rod all the way up and foam the whole way between it. And that's what seals the door there. 
and then that's it. Wow. I've got the glaziers coming on Thursday to glaze that glass. Right. And then we'll pop the doors in. Yep. And the doors are in. Wow. So it's cool. And then I can start, I feed the weatherboards in behind them is basically what I do. Okay. Because it's, there's sometimes you can make the weatherboards, put it all in and stick the door up. But we don't have a really big flange on this. We haven't got a massive distance that we go in. We're sort of going in about 20 mils. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another piece of plastic, damp proof course, it's going to fold around and come back. I'm going to staple that in there. It's like a little channel. And what that'll do is I'll put my, that'll run the whole length. And then I put a head flashing in the top. And then I, before I put the head flashing in, I'll drop all my weatherboards in and nail them all the way up here. Gotcha. And then that flashing will stop any water from get, that gets in behind running it outside and stopping it from going in there. Right. Then I'll, when I get up to the weatherboard up the top here, which goes to about here, the next one will be on the top of the flashing. Then I'll put my flashings on first. And they're both like these ones, which are hard to see at the moment, but they've actually empty. I've, I've done sides on them. I've done a side on them and they empty out like this. So it actually is like a little funnel that right. empties out. So do you have to create a storyline up the side of, of the... Yeah, for the where the weatherboards go. Yeah. Yep, that's, and I've got that on my stick here. Okay. And it sits on the deck. Gotcha. It's the deck's level, so... Gotcha. I just sit it on the deck. This is the top of each weatherboard. Gotcha. So it's literally a case of popping it on like that. Donk. Right. I'll just put a packer on, a deck packer or something, and then I mark it on here. And then I mark it in two spots. But I'm also chucking my little level on it at the same time when I'm nailing them up. So I want them to be level. Right. And I work from the bottom all the way up. I've got to probably pull another board off here and do the bottom boards yep. first. All the way along. And then these ones on the side will go pretty quick. Yep. And then there's a couple on the top and there's a cut in. And the way it works out with the height, what happens is I've got one that'll be 116 mils above. So that'll just have a little check out like that. Gotcha. And then that next one is it actually comes up about oh, it's kind of about there so then the next one pretty much comes down even with the bottom right so the last board runs through that'll be good eh? yeah so it, yeah. it was a marriage i'm trying to get it so that where this flashing comes out the bottom i need to have a minimal part of the weatherboard where it comes out behind here right and then so that because that needs to be over top of the weatherboard right yeah you know yeah, so yeah. i need a minimal part of the weatherboard there because it has to be five mils gap between the door. There's a lot of mathematics in this stuff. It's eh? actually complicated. I'm, I'm following what you're saying and yeah, thinking, it's, that's actually quite difficult. It is. It's all, yeah. you've got to keep on referring back to the mouldings and looking at where the moulding sits and everything and going, okay, so like I had to cut back the joists here. Yep. So my decking will be cut around the door. Right. You can see where it goes in. Yep. And even that was, I had to do that before I fitted them. I had to make sure that I cut them back because they wouldn't fit. So. Yeah, it's all mathematics. You've got to plan everything out, and then when you put them in, you want them to fit. Yeah, right. Good stuff, bro. Yeah. Oh, good good work today, mate. Yeah, yeah mucked yeah. around. Probably because I've been all away. The backings of the tape to clean up. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> that stuff is, is super sticky. Plastic packers that slide in of varying thicknesses. Of, so what I do is I basically screw through them, hold them in, drill a hole through, right. screw through them. Yeah. And that securely fastens this, like, solidly... As perfect as I can make it, obviously. Square, plumb, everything. Screws right. it into that opening there. Okay. And this is stapled around the frame, around a flange. And that's actually what holds the windows in, is the timber that holds the windows in. Right. So this is treated timber anyway. Yeah. Always as a matter of course. There won't be any leaks, but they do it as a matter of, if, in case there yep. was some, obviously. So then now I'll pop this out. I'm going to put the same polyurethane sealant underneath the foot here. Okay. Same thing again, running in some lines like that. It stops the potential of any squeaking or anything like this. Right. Glues it together, so it's one one thing. It doesn't move anyway. It's pretty solid. Is it normal to have a, a gap that big normally? Yep. Is it? Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. What yep. I do is I put a foam rod between it. Oh, yep. And then I run that foam, that yep. sealing foam, all the way around it. Right. So, yeah, 20 mils is about the biggest you want. We've got about probably 15 in the biggest point. And then I have these spaces, which are indicative of my weatherboards. Oh, yep. Is, was the whole reason why I needed the weatherboards was to yeah, figure right, gotcha. out yeah. exactly oh, that's yeah, where okay. the weatherboards sit right under like perfect that. yeah perfect. it is yeah so that was the whole crucial thing about waiting for the weatherboards before we could even set these doors up yeah and then on the inside 
we've got 10 mil jib which is this so then bang that's where our jib sits right and then our architrave goes around the outside okay so that's that's it's all the widths worked out perfectly as well yeah. the suit all this sort of stuff magic it is so yeah i'll pop it out now i prepare everything first cut all my spacings then i put the lines of um polyurethane seal it down i stick it back onto it i push it up against those things put a couple of temporary screws in the top right pull it over a couple in the bottom and then i go about placing all my other ones i put one right where the lock is here i put a big packer right there and one right there so that it's a good hard area yeah because the door gets slammed yeah yeah last thing you want is flex where it's hitting yeah that makes sense actually so that's that's that that's that's what i'll do and um that'll be both those two doors take me a bit of time but they're basically already because i made this level base yep they sit in there perfect so all i have to do is make sure this is level right and then it is all as good as it can be thanks up no worries bruno <laughs> Stay. 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 How to do, Pace? Come on. Morning, ladies. Oh, not there, Pace. Right, we're all going to stand to do the bloody electric fence. And don't touch it. You get a shock off it, you dirty bugger. Why do dogs have to poo in the most inconvenient places? Isn't he a messy bastard, eh? It's a bit of roadkill I stuck there last night for the hawks. You know where to do your poo, don't you, eh? But he doesn't seem to understand about the electric fence over here, and periodically he just walks right through it. One day he's going to find out what it actually does. He's just been lucky. Everybody's having a poop, and now having a bit of a scrap. And when there's four dogs like that, I'm just sort of watching carefully, and Bruno comes in like I'm the boss. Still interested in Poe's ass, but nothing's going on there because she's been spayed. Hey, no more puppies coming out of here. No more fornicating with the dogs. It's all over, Poe, which is good because that's how fights begin. A bitch on heat, nothing worse than making males fight. Constantly, father and son have this old bull, young bull thing going on, challenging each other all the time. You see B disappearing in the background there to try and find something to go and catch, like a hare or something. And meanwhile, Poe, well, she's right there, aren't you, mate? Wagging your tail. Come up, say good day. Hey, you're a good dog. What's that flying over here? Oh, it looks like a Cessna, is it? Sounds like one. What's that, guys? Someone, someone comment. What is that? Cessna? These guys don't give up. Right way to keep fit. He's fast. Fit right now, the dogs have been getting plenty of hunting. Be calm! <whistles> Yippee! He's just picked up an apple. Be calm! He's lost his apple. He's trying to get it before another dog gets it. Biggs is going to try and get his apple. These guys have a lot of fun with apples on the orchard. What you doing, Biggsy? Hey? Hey? What you doing, Biggsy? Good boy, Biggsy. Biggsy, come. Come here, mate. Get him, mate. This is a lovely dog. You're a good boy, aren't you, eh? Yes, you are. Lovely dog. You're a good boy. Yes, you are. Good boy, Big Z. Oh, yes, you are. We're off to a real late start today with the dogs. Normally, I'm, I'm walking them much earlier than this. But I had some jobs to do. And finally come back and run them now. And none of the dogs have pooed in their kennel. As you see, they've all gone now. They've held onto it. So, some people say to me, oh, my dog shits in the kennel. And my answer to that problem is that's your fault, mate, because you didn't get up early each morning like I normally do and train your dogs to go toilet first thing outside the kennel. Dogs don't want to defecate in their kennel. They want it to be clean, but if you don't run them regularly and get them up early in the morning when they've been holding their bowel all night, they will poo in their kennel, and then they'll get into the habit of thinking it's acceptable to poo in their kennel, which it's not. So uh, if you've got a dog that's pooing in the kennel all the time, that's because you didn't get up early enough to take care of it. It's as simple as that. None of my dogs poo in their kennel, unless they're locked in there and they can't get out. And this morning I'm, I'm about two hours late than usual. It's nine o'clock. And normally I'm sort of doing the dogs at about six or seven. Uh, I guess they thought, well, hold on, he's going to come soon. I'll hold on to my poo. And as you see, they've all done it outside the kennel now. 
You will not see poo in my dog's kennels. I just don't like it and I think it's not fair for the dog because they can stand on it and then reinfect themselves with hookworm, all the different worms that can go through the pads of their feet. It's, just, it's not healthy. Uh, I worm my dogs every 12 weeks to keep on top of that as well. So yeah, worming's important. Especially when you're feeding them like small animals like I do. But in nature, you know, all animals have got worms. Wolves have worms in them. Most animals, lions, tigers, they've all got worms inside them, parasites. Uh, but to keep on top of that and give the dog the best sort of health, you worm them. Now Poe's doing her shit. Everybody's doing her shit this morning. Hey, it's great to be able to poo in public like that, eh, Poe? She's still watching what's going on while she's even pooing. Good, healthy poop. Roadkill. I seldom drive past it. That'll feed Bruno for a whole day. Possum. Introduced to New Zealand from Australia. So we've got quite a few possums in New Zealand. The brush tail possum. I don't know when they come over. Is it 1837? I should know because I wrote a song about it. Because the only good possum is a dead possum. So we shoot the bastard down. Anyway, they're a great resource. And they're a pest, but they're also a great resource. And I'm parked in a fucking stupid place here. Right on the side of the road. Right, we'll carry on. There you go, turn it. If you have a dog that's a fast eater, then cut your dog roll up because they can choke on it. Eat up. Hey, ducky. How you doing? Hey. You have to be the old posse, am you? Hey. Is that what you want? You want to be the old posse on? Mmm. And Bruno's waiting for his. Hey team, one for you. That's for Pace. And that's for Bigsy. <laughs> Not that you could care less which one's which. You're fussy, eh? Eat up. Eat up. They eat so small, eh? There's some really small bites. You guys are too well fed. Little well, Bigsy having little bites here. Well, you've got your one now, Bigsy. Well done. Pace. You're wanting me to chop this up? There you go, Pace. Eat up, Pace. He likes to be hand fed, you see. Bigsy takes wee bites. Yeah, I know you're waiting for it, but I've got something else for you, mate. Hey, Poe. I didn't actually say eat up, mate, but you can have it. Good girl. Well, here's the old mate here. And what is he? He got smashed right in the head, didn't he? Yeah, I think it's a male. Yeah, a couple of nads in there. Yeah, we might shorten that tail a bit too, just so he didn't choke on it. You good boy. Eat up. Eat up. Where you go? Where you go, Bruno? Where you go? It won't take him too long to eat that. We'll just leave him in peace. He's taken away from me because he likes to eat in private. The first thing he'll eat is a head. He's eating the brain, and he's, look, he's left the jaw aside there. See that beside him there? That's the jaw there, the teeth. So they know how to eat around all the sharp bits, and that's why I don't worry too much about the claws, because dogs aren't stupid. So this rooster just turned up to my place, uh, having his lunch break, and he's got this. What is it, bro? So it's the Sport Dog Tech 2.0. Um, tracking collar for pig hunting. Right. Well, tracking unit, and I've got three collars. So two units and three collars. And it's brand new. Yeah. Never used. No. Nah. Just come out of the box now. And you want to sell it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because he's going to go to Garmin, yeah? Yeah, I'm going to go to the Garmin <laughs> stuff. Yeah, so how are you? I'm not going to ask how you acquired these. They didn't fall off the back of a truck, did they? No, they didn't. They're totally legit. Back. Totally legit. Yeah, I wouldn't be putting them on the channel if they weren't. But uh, I've hunted with you with these, and they're not bad. I, I personally prefer Garmin, but uh, do you have a price in mind, or just they can talk no. to you about it? Make an offer. Make an offer. Brand new. Yeah. So you got that and three collars. Yep. And one of them is a track and train collar too. Shit, that's good. Okay. All right, Pagunas, you heard it. Anyway, mate, I've got to carry on my day. Good to see you. Sweet.
Have a good one. See ya. Fell off the back of a truck, mate, as she passed me by. It fell off the back of a truck, mate. No, no, it's legit. It's legit. These old ones are stuffed up, and they, those guys replaced it, and he's shifting to the the uh, the better ones, I reckon. Mind you, they were good units in their time. Just coming in to chuck in your new double glaze windows oh, yeah. uh, into the Vance Lotus. Right, eh? Yeah. They must be heavy, eh? There's yeah, two glass uh, together. Oh, they weighing in that 40 kg? Yeah, right, jeez. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a two bloke mission, isn't it? Oh, should be alright. Should yeah. be good. You've done a few? Yeah, yeah, plenty. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. No problem at all. And Arp's getting ready for the first sheet of cladding. First weatherboard. First weatherboard, yep. That's the difference between young men and old I was just going to say, <laughs> it's a two man job, and then he warned his boy, you can just imagine this bloke with a pig on his back, being gun up the hill. So was that sheet alone? For, no, that was a 40 kg, surely not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, mate, oh, you made that look easy. <laughs> Holy shit! That one's a little bit hard. Yeah, that's well, like we it should be good. Still get old one day, mate. <laughs> Saves me doing so much I, gym workouts in the night. I can't <laughs> believe that's 40k and you lifted that like it was just nothing, bud. Holy shit. Well, we might have an e-bike. <laughs> <laughs> easy. So used to carry 40 kg. Oh, a few mountain bike jokes. Jeez, that, that was a piece of piss, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. That'd be two of us to lift that. It's like a bag of cement, 40k, gee. And the amount of whinging afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus, that was heavy. Oh, the pain. Don't you wish you were in your 20s again, bro? No, because I'd have to relive all the stuff I've done, and I'm quite happy to be where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, good on you, mate. Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah, there's pros and cons, eh? That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So there's a polysulfide seal that runs between the two panels of glass. Right, eh? And that's stopped by an aluminium spacer bar. That, right. Um, keeps okay. The distance between them. What's the function of that? Uh, so that's your main seal that keeps right. all the gets all the moisture, uh, moisture and water out. and whatnot yeah. keep going inside your unit and right keeps it all. And then this and this strip here, what does that do? Uh, so that's your aluminium bead. Oh yep. Uh, that just clips on at the top to help oh. secure your glass. Right. And then and we that's put it. a rubber wedge in the back to pressurise it against your bead. Such a great tool. Yeah, I just very flexible for moving around due to terrain and angles and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you'll be lock up tonight. Right, eh? That'll be great, eh? Yeah. No more tarpaulin? No more tarpaulin. You confident you're going to get these all on today? Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because your door's always open. Yeah, right. <laughs> but True. we'll be weather tight. That's weather tight as it is. Yeah. Was the door open this morning again, was it? No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not locked. Yeah, yeah. I've got two keys for you too, for those uh, sliders. Yeah, it's only it's only locked when uh, Bruno's not not here. Yeah. Otherwise, it's always unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> He's Roman. Yeah, that's enough of a deterrent. Yeah. For, yeah, it is. yeah. It's always great watching um, experienced tradesmen do their job. I mean, they make it look so easy. Yeah. yeah but it's not. You Actually, know, rolling just rolling that rubber in. It's yep. got to be lined up properly, the wedge to roll it in. Right. And if it's not, it doesn't want to go in properly. And, yeah. 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 No, that's why it's all divided up now and these yeah. different trades do different stuff all the time hey. because the, the legislation of the whole shit nowadays you've really got to specialize you know like yeah. you have to do that properly and like all this wall wrapping and all this sort of stuff yeah the average home handyman does it he has a chance to upgrade his wall to make it really waterproof and safe and everything but he won't he'll just fix what he needs to fix yeah and he's actually missing out on an opportunity to make it better yeah safer absolutely yeah. what it's all about so totally. a big shake and then it all stays really solid and you go oh well, the front wall's really cool. The rest of the house has got all cracks in the gym. Mm. Why is that? Mm. You know, and that's that thing that happens, eh? This is the bottom board. So the bottom board has to get cut with a 15 degree angle on it. So the water drips away. This is a smaller board than would go around the rest of the house. If I was doing the whole house, it's because it's under the deck. I've set the boards to suit the head flashing and underneath the bottom where the tray flashing is. So I cut a 15 degree like that and then where it, I recoat the bottom where I've cut it. Where it joins, it's a running mitre, so it laps over. I also coat that as well. What uh, percentage do you cut that, bud? That's 45. 45 degrees? Yep. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like that old Midnight Oil song. 45 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Having a black coffee this morning. Mmm, looks good. What you doing in the house there, Bruno? Hey? Good boy. Hey, what you doing here? Hey? Time to buy a new tack. That's buggered. So what do you do, mate? Stick your sandwiches in it, do you? Yep. Nice hot sandwich today. Yep, that's uh, chicken and cheese. Cool. Chicken from the other night. Oh, you've done it already? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you just like use this your heater now to keep warm on a cold day. <laughs> yeah, you can see the fat from the cheese. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Good, good tucker. for me. I'll tell you one thing about the keto diet is I do miss the old toast, mate. But hey, sacrifices we make. Although you can get keto toast, eh, which is not bad. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, welcome to another episode Smoko with Ab. And today I'm having black coffee because today's a fasting day for me. Okay, I'm cheesing um, chicken sandwiches. Cheese and chicken. Yep. yep. Sourdough toast. Nice. Mm. Tasty and a hot, yeah, hot toaster. Mm. Yep. Or toasty maker. Toast maker? Toasty. Sam toasty sandwich maker. Toasted sandwich maker. Mm. Yeah. So I do one day a week where I don't eat anything, but I do drink a coffee, black. And that gives me 48 hours of fasting because I eat every 24 hours. And the interesting thing is that I'm gaining weight. Isn't that interesting? Mm. So a lot of people say, oh, you've got to eat more, you know, well, um, I'm fasting for a reason, for health reasons, and I have been, like, for uh, two years now, but I'm actually gaining weight. So 16 months ago, I was in a wheelchair weighing 56 kilogram, very sick boy. And today, I'm now 67, so I'm edging up. I'm actually, my, my BMI for my age and my height right now is around about that, 67, actually at the, the healthy weight. But I'm gaining muscle mass and losing fat as I go through this fasting and, and eating good nutrition. That no clip, no that, rubbish. That clip from Mapua, you had a lot more solid then. That music clip that you... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. I was much bigger then, yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, was, I, was, I used to be 74 kilogram. And yeah. I've... So to get back to my normal weight would be quite hard because I've lost a lot of muscle mass through infection and yeah. disease uh, and cancer. But I am definitely... On this program, I'm definitely building muscle and strength slowly, and that's what you want to do. You want to build, it's like when you lose weight, you don't want to lose weight fast, yeah. you want to lose it very slowly, you want to gain it back slowly, and this is the best way to do it. But you've got to be disciplined, it's hard because today's a cold day, and I'm, I'm actually hungry today. Mm. It's a cold day, and I'm, I'm, my body's going, but this is how we evolved, and this is actually the whole thing of fasting and the state of autophagy. You've got to actually push through that and reap the benefits. It's a bit like cold water therapy. You know, I haven't got the, I can't do everything, but ideally those guys that jump in a cold shower every morning, they are increasing their immune system. They are increasing a lot of things, their longevity of life. They're decreasing their chances of cancer or, or, or um, depression or a lot of things. And it's really boots the whole immune system, but I just can't do it in the winter. Mm. I did it in the summer uh, last year, but I, mm. I want to get to that stage where I can do some cold water each day because what it does is it increases your brown um, fat cells and they keep your body warmer all the time and in, in return you actually get warmer mm. but you're just getting through the pain of it and I have done it but right now I just one thing at a time eh? <laughs> yeah, I do a um, hot shower for muscle warm-up that's a good idea because, I, I, um, I can do the hot shower <laughs> yeah because even setting up all my gear in the morning I have to pace myself with light stuff first yep and then like my drop saw is one of my heavier tools. Yep. It sits up on a little pedestal so I don't have to bend down to pick it up. Right. The amount of times, and my saw bench as well sits up on a pedestal as well. Yep. The amount of times that I've pulled muscle cold in the morning, setting yep. up for a day's work. Right. And then you might as well just pack it all in. Yep. Go back home, lie on your belly, put ice on the back, half an hour on, half an hour off. Yep. It's worked for me on numerous occasions. And I have to do that. Like I have to pack up and go back. Yeah. Go back home. If I don't, I'll have four days of... You know, and at operating at fifty percent efficiency. Well, if I do that, I'll come back tomorrow at ninety-five percent efficiency. That's interesting, isn't it? And one of the things, whether you're doing any form of like martial arts or sport or anything at all, or in the case of what Arb's doing, physical hard labour. A lot of people, like when I used to do running, a lot of people used to do a lot of stretching before they go for a run. And I'm actually not an advocate for that. People will say stretching's important. I'm I, I'm a believer myself. 
that warming up is more important, getting your body warmed up. So when I used to go for a run, I used to do a lot of barefoot running. What I'd do was I'd go for a little short run, stop, short run, stop. Often a lot of people that I'd go running with would actually pull a muscle while they were stretching pre-run. They'd actually be doing a stretch and that's when they'd pull their muscle. So, you know, what Arb's talking about, how he sets up the small equipment first and then the big equipment, he's basically warming up slowly. It's a natural way to do it. And when you think about how we, you know, evolved by, you know, um, say hunting, you know, we go out and we'd be tracking to begin with. Well, straight away there, you're tracking the animal. That's that's warming up. You're not going fast. You're stopping to look at the sign. You're smelling the, the dung to see how old it is. Uh, you're turning over stuff. You're, you're looking around. You're scouting here. You're scouting there. So you start to warm up. And then slowly you get, you know, warmer. And then you get onto the animal. Now, man sweats. Most beasts don't have that ability to sweat. They don't have sweat glands. A gazelle can't sweat. A, a deer can't sweat. So what we would do is, we would start to run that animal down and we'd start off slow and of course the animal to begin with would do a hundred meter, two hundred meter fast burst which we couldn't possibly get close to in fright but the man would keep on jogging and repeat it again and he'd always keep visuals on the deer either by tracking it on the ground or watching it and he'd keep on moving a slow lop, loping along, not fast and the animal would run for a burst again. This would happen maybe over the course of two or three hours the man would keep on running, and you know what? After a time, the animal would start to heat up. So would the man, but the man had one thing in his favour, and that is he could sweat. The sweat glands allowed him to cool off, and he would hydrate as he's going. He might stop for a stream and drink, but keep on going, but he would keep pressure on that animal. Eventually, he would come to the deer, or the gazelle, and it would be legs splayed, tongue hanging out, and it was exhausted, and it couldn't go any further, and he would then take a spear and give it the coup de gras. Now, back in the day when my father was a hunter in Field and National Park, one of the things some of the colours used to do, these men were incredibly fit because they spent most of their time either jumping out of a helicopter, um, paunching a deer, sticking it on the strop, running to the next one. These machines cost a lot of money to run and all the time these guys would go, go, go all day. Also the deer colours that were on the hill all day, go, 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 they were very fit men. And one of the things some of them used to do as a wee test of their strength is they used to see who could run down a deer. Now most of you hunters began bullshit, can't be done. Well in fact it was done, it was done in Fjordland. And my father told me of numerous men that could run down deer. They did it over a long period of time. They didn't do it in five minutes. They stayed on the animal and they did it in places where they had visuals or they could track it and they'd stay on that one deer and they would aim it for it all the time. they keep on going and eventually they would run it down. We can do that. We have the ability to do that. And that's why when vegans and vegetarians give me assholes about hunting and that and I say, well, if it wasn't for your ancestors, you wouldn't be here because they evolved in a way they could hunt they could sweat and they could run down animals and that's the way we did it mm. is it my phone or yours going mine you're so popular see now he's on the channel he's like in big demand all over all over the country can i get up on this job <laughs> that's right yeah anyway the good news is the good news is that there is no asbestos in here yeah i've got the report to give to our i'll give you the, a print out of that yeah, yeah. the paperwork thank you mark rudolph hats off to mark rudolph yeah He's been, yeah, hats off, man, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> one of us is, uh, is, is challenged a bit follically here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the sun comes out at the same time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you right. Don't need that beanie now. Hey, it's a good head of skin, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, you've got fluff there, mate. I've got a wee bit of fluff here. It's yeah. cut short. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sadly, uh, without the hair, I'm starting to get these little things. I don't even see on the side of my head there. There's a wee... Age spots. Yeah, from the sun and cancer, yeah. and it's, it's a bit of a bastard not having hair because you've got to wear one all the time because... We have a very high rate of melanoma skin cancer in New Zealand. I'm going to get that one checked out. Yep. Huh? Yeah, whereas Arb's well protected. Mind you, you've been in the sun your whole life too as a builder, eh? Yeah, so, you yeah. know. And living up in the tropics. Yeah. But I've got a bit of um, Maori and Indian blood in me. You so have, yeah. Those two things are quite helpful. Right. Arb's a mixture of Dutch, Indian. And Naitahu. Naitahu. So he's got all these cool things. The, the the Dutch, he's like a really good worker. The the Maori, he is a really good singer. That's a bit of a stereotype, <laughs> but all my Maori mates can sing. I don't know why they can all they all can. I don't know if it's because they don't get, give no fucks about what anybody else thinks. They just sing. Or I they reckon just, it's about inhibition, yeah. Inhibition, but they can. All my mates in Maori can sing beautifully. And then he's got the Indian, and he can cook up a feed, man. A good curry, <laughs> and that's <laughs> not stereotyping. Curry. It's true. Oh yeah, I love I've it. had curry at your place before. And all these things come together. It's funny how a different culture you have different things. And of course, he's allowed to take the piss out of all three. Yep. He can take the piss out of all three. He can do an Indian accent. If I do an Indian accent, I'll be told off because it's racist. But if you do one, you're allowed to, eh? That's right. 
my grand my grandfather was Indian, so I am liking very much to do the Indian accent. It is quite possible. Every time I go into the dairy, my friend Raj down on Tohuna Drive makes his own curry pies, and I talk to Raj. I go, "Hello, Raj. How are you doing?" He goes, "Adarayan. I am very good too." So we talk this way, so we can understand each other. So I speak Indian. <laughs> Not only do you do the speaking, but you do the facial and the head thing, don't you? Yeah, I am thinking this is correct. Can you do the Irish? I can do the Irish accent. That's no problem at all. That's it's a, just uh, give me a pint of Guinness and I can do the Irish accent all night long. Hurts more I can do the Scottish accent as well. <laughs> Got that one, sis. <laughs> I can also do the one from Cornwall. Oh, you, right. ah, you can tell I'm from Cornwall because I'm walking around with a turnip in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I quite fucking like the Irish accent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dog Pace. He talks with an Irish accent, eh? Yeah, yeah, he's looking at high pitch checks. He's like, yeah. What the fuck are you looking at, you con? <laughs> so, what about the um, we used to watch Coronation Street when we were kids. Well, we didn't watch it, our parents watched it. We, we were forced to watch it. We had to put up with Coronation Street. Well, it was on the TV, wasn't it? It was on the TV. So we had to watch it. There was one channel and it had one program, it was Coronation Street pretty much. And that went on for like about a million years. Right, I died and, three times during the, the continual thing of that. It just went on and on, on and, and on, on and on. And on, on, on. Lives, Coronation right. Street was something that that you you go away for ten years and you come back and you you could pick up where you carried on because it moved that fucking slow, eh? And the Rovers returned. I mean, what a great local pub! Oh yeah, was they? Yeah. yeah, well, the English. That's what they do. They nip down for a swift uh, pint, don't they? It's like, right, oh, I think I've done everything I need to have done today. I think I'll nip down to the to the local for a swift half pint. You know, and they all talk like that, don't they? Oh yeah, the ones from London, do they? Yeah, well, they got yeah, a bit. Yeah, you know, they got a bit going on, haven't they? Yeah, you know, got a bit of stuff going. You're right. You're right, lad, aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah and they got these these words like the Kazi. What's the Kazi? Toilet. Toilet, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the Gregory. Yeah, what's the Gregory? Telephone. <laughs> Telephone. Gregory Peck played Captain Hornblower. <laughs> <laughs> Heard it from an English guy when I was traveling. <laughs> he goes, Oh, yeah, he uses Gregory. And I go, What's the Gregory? He goes, Well, oh, don't you know, mate? And I go, No, he goes, It's a bloody telephone, isn't it? And I go, How does it get telephone turned into Gregory? And he goes, well, It's quite simple, isn't it? Gregory played Captain Ormblower, and it's a bloody blower, isn't it? And so I can't fault that logic, really, can you? <laughs> no, no, nothing wrong with that logic. Mm. All these different accents in different places around the world, but we also like to sometimes talk American because we grew up watching American. American television. One program I really enjoyed was the Dukes of Hazard. Do you remember oh, that? You, <laughs> you got your ears on there, little bit. <laughs> that was Cletus, wasn't it? No, that was the sheriff. The sheriff, it? yeah. Rocko Pico training. <laughs> and he got you got your ears on there, little fat buddy. Is this fat guy always eating chicken in the office, like you know? And, and he's two dumb sheriffs out there. And then you got the the Dukes of Hazard, the yeah. two boys with Bo the, and Luke. Bo and Luke. <laughs> You know, They'd just, go just a good old boys. They never meant no harm. Yeah, it was a good old song. And then, of course, we had uh, the, the Hillbillies. Well, Hillbilly. first thing you know, well, did Oh, oh yeah. I only know the bad version of that. Yeah. So, <laughs> all those programs we grew up with, they kind of shaped our lives. But what I used to really love was I used to love Bonanza because they had guns in Bonanza. And they had, like, the. I used to think, man, I'd love to own a gun one day. Of course, as a little boy, it was a dream to have a gun. And there was all those westerns you watch. You know, back in the day when men, they have a cigarette. If you, if you smoked, you're a man, you know. Like the Marlboro Man. Yeah, the Marlboro <laughs> Man. They all died of cancer in the end afterwards. No one talked about that. Do you know the Marlboro Man died of cancer? Yeah, right? he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Lung yeah. cancer, yep. That's it. Looks so cool and so romantic out there on the plains, and he died of a slow, painful death of lung cancer. Yeah. But those programs were cool we had back in the day. And I haven't watched TV for 20 years now. No, I, no, I stopped watching it because I, I wanted to decide what I choose to watch. So yeah. then I started watching YouTube. And just watch the things I like. So you watch a mountain bike video, maybe because you're into mountain biking, or you yeah. might watch something you're interested in. I'll watch like a hunting or a fishing show, or sometimes I like to watch music videos too. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. It, it yeah. depends what's going on. We're yeah. watching a bit of stuff on tiny homes at the moment. Great. Yeah, and um, it's American tiny homes, but um, it's quite interesting. I find it really quite interesting. Are you going to build one? Well, we're looking at thinking about building a granny flat in our property, so we're going through the process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, doing a bit of a design up now, and then I'll do a price for the materials, and um, yeah, just go through the motions and see whether it actually is worthwhile doing or not. Yeah. Basically, yeah. so number numbers, crunching numbers game. Pretty much, yeah. Yep. Well, this house here, somebody wrote on my channel last night. I thought you were going to knock the house over and build a log cabin. So I talked to Arb about this, and Arb's been my mate since forever, and and you know I trust him, and. He had a look at the house and he said, no, nope. he said, value for money, you are better off renovate. Renovate, yes, to renovate, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And, and he's right. And 
I had another look at our friend's house that's been renovated, and you know what? Old houses, those are hundred years old, that have been renovated properly, they have a nice living feeling in them. They've got this energy going through them that you just can't get with a brand new sparkly home. Yep, you um, remember that place in Collingwood Street that we yes. looked at one time? So yes. that had a complete ground up renovation. Beautiful home. Yeah, yeah, beautiful home. And that still carries the character of, that's from 1857, I believe, that one. Mm. And it still carries the character, but it's 2017 was when we pretty much finished that job. But it's safe. It's strong, yep. it's insulated, it's warm, yeah, right. it works, it's still got some, it's got some glazed, um, what do you call it, um, lead light windows, oh, yeah. <clears throat> with a double glazed portion, you know, so it's yeah. like, the lead it's light's cool. still there, but it's yeah. clear double glazing mm. behind it with a shield of glass over the top of it as well, so things like that. And you've got to remember, when you look at a house like this, it's going to cost $25,000 to get rid of it. Yeah, that's the cost of just removing it. Yeah, yeah, so that costs you twenty five grand. so then you go, okay, well... What can we do with that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And a log cabin, there's a good square meterage here. You've basically got a good bathroom. You know, yep. we know there's insulation in the ceiling in places. It's just yep. lacking in the walls. Yep. So we'll go around, we'll pull the lining off on every outside wall in every room and insulate that outside wall and replace the window or door if we need to. Yep. And then that does the, it makes more of a capsule. Okay, so there's about 50% heat loss through the ceiling, say, and there's about probably 30 to 40 through the uh, walls and windows, and there's really 20 through the floor, they say. Yeah. This is just due to going like that. But doing the wall and the windows and everything, and then putting thick carpet in certain places, and then picking tiles or whatever you may use in, in your living areas and stuff like that, reduces that heat loss because that heat loss is through one sheet of flooring is basically how they work that out. Right, so yeah. you can get, you know, your heat loss down to 10% going through your floor sort of yeah. thing if you can't insulate the floor. Mm. Some of the rooms we may cut the floor up yep. if it's a bit buggered. Yep. We look at it sure. and it's like, ah, we'll cut it up. And then so that floor, we will insulate under that room. Mm. History has been made, folks. This is <laughs> the very first weatherboard going on. This is awkward, but... It's a hard place to get to, bud. Yeah, that is a little bit. Someone built a veranda on here. Yeah, someone called you. <laughs> but this is the first board to go in. Yep, yep. So that's the flashing that goes underneath the sill of the door. And these two weatherboards go below that flashing. So what happens is any water that gets around the edges of the door or behind the weatherboards up the top or anything comes down. Ultimately, it gets spilled out outside the cladding at the bottom. Right. This is how this whole system works. So this weatherboard is quite crucial to follow the line that I've got marked on all the way along. So I'm just tacking it on with screws. Right. And then following my line and then I'm checking with another piece that it's good. I know that these are perfect. I yep. look along the top of the doors, they're in a perfect line and they're both dead level. So this tells me exactly how much below those flashings that it needs to be. And that's the guide all the way along. It's quite critical you get this the first is, one right Yeah, out. this is the critical one. So this, this could take me couple of hours to get yep. it done technically Gotta be but right then after that it's just bang 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 there's the top of every weatherboard i see you've got your yeah. um story bang, what do you call your story, story line up there going around i just chuck a little level on them and i just go he's marked I'll each one pre-cut the whole lot yeah and we'll pre-cut and then i just work my way up up to the top so it goes really quite fast once you set up crucial yeah. that the setup's right great just been just been for a bike ride and come back and that's where arb's at it's happening looks good doesn't it Wow. Nice look, huh? Oh, yeah, bro. Looks awesome, man. You happy with progress? Yeah. Me yeah. too. That's genuine tree wood, this wood here. That's really a good, bro. Looks awesome, man. Yeah, that actually looks awesome. It's all going together just as... Uh... As I'd hope. Yeah, no, it's good, bro. This uh, gun tip, beautiful, nice. Use a little spacer off the door, so I get it in the same place all the time. Yeah. I draw a line up there and I centre the screw in the centre of the line as I go up. Nice. So just to keep the line straight. There's always easy ways to try and keep your line straight. Sometimes, and I like it that I can just. I don't trust the, don't trust it to get that, I punch it too much. Yep. 
So I just want it to hold, I want the head to be above the timber. Yeah. So it holds it, allows it to move, mm -hmm. do its thing. If you need to replace one individual weatherboard, you can bang the doggy bar, which you can bang into it. Right. Point the nails out, cut yep. that piece of board out, and replace that one piece of board. Okay. Because it slips up the back of the other one and drops in. Right, that's why you've left them almost not flush with the wood, just slightly up. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So I want the nail to go right through the solid bit. Yep. What happens is this is a corner flashing here. Mm -hmm. We put a, I put a box around the corner here. Yep. And then this stops any water from going behind them. Righto. You know? Yep. And it allows it all to just move and do its thing. So then I do a box here. Because I'm leaving your weatherboards on, I'm going to put this behind the box on that side of your weatherboard. Right, righto. That's right about the best, that's all we can do. I can't fit yeah. it behind it or can't do anything else. See so this one here is split a wee bit, eh, on the, on the end. Is that because of where it is or just, was it split anyway? It might, it might be. You want me to pull it off, eh? Well, I don't know, what do you reckon? Should be right, shouldn't it? It has split. Did it split where it nailed? Yeah, it is. Looks like it has. Can you see it there? Mm. I haven't got the oh, glasses I can on. now when I come down on this angle there. Creep. It, maybe it was just coincidentally had a split because it looks like it's got a running line here too. Yeah, that one on the bottom is a machine line. You see how it runs along? Yeah, true, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or well, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, um, can, can water track in through that no, split? No. There's no reason to replace it then. No, there isn't. I think it's fine. Yeah, no. Yeah, the split runs downhill. Yeah, it does run downhill. Yeah. We're going to do another <laughs> coat on it? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah I don't um, think you'll ever see it. Two even. more coats, yeah. you won't see it. Yeah. And even if you did, it's replaceable later on. Uh, yeah, so, you know. yeah, but it'd be fine. Yeah, no, she's looking good. I see you've got that taping around the outside, eh? This, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that just, again, it's just as the rain comes in, it just sends it down the outside of the door. If it goes behind it, which is not likely really, but if it does, then it ends up coming out this little sill flashing at the bottom here. Yeah, right. Falling out there. Mm. So it's, it's pretty cool, you know, like. Oh, yeah. We're building houses like everyone else in the world now. <laughs> Euros have been doing this sort of stuff for a while in Northern Europe, you know? Yeah. And just dealing with cold and with... They don't quite get the rain that we get, most European countries. Yeah, right. But um, I've had condensation issues and all that sort of stuff. Sure. Bloody good. Bloody good. G'day. Well, that's the end of the day, or the end of the week for me too. So the glazers come, glaze the doors. Got that all done, and then I got two of the wall partitions done here, the long hard plank along the bottom and the cedar on two of them. Monday will be, probably finish that wall, I would imagine, no dramas. Yeah. On Monday, and then um, probably chuck that other window around the side. Yeah, it looks good, bro. Yeah. Oh, you have a great long weekend, mountain yeah. biking again. Yeah, tomorrow I've got to go and look at another um, job for, I've got two clients. Oh, yeah. Three counting you. Yep. I don't take on any more clients. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, bud. Hey, well, thank you. Actually, give me an old man hug. <laughs> Have a good one, bud, and oh, I'll, I'll see you when I see you. you Monday, yeah? See me Monday morning. Beauty. Well, uh, as you can see, it's getting pretty dark. I've had Daniel here, he's just leaving. There's his truck down there. He's been helping me. We've been building a planter box today. We're having a lot of fun, mucking around. I'm heading down to the houseboat with the two dogs I've got in the back Pace and Bigsy. Oh, clever old Bigsy. Anyway, uh, this has been quite a long vlog. Thanks for watching, and if you made it right to the end, smash the like button so I know you're still here and that I did something right in this one. And good luck with your own bits and pieces. Whatever you're creating, you're building, you're hunting, you're cooking, you're discovering, all the challenges you're facing, I hope they're all going well and you're facing them all head on. And be good. If you can't be good, then be careful. We'll see you later. Logan started driving, he's making a noise. Little new face! Bloody hell. You were driving it, you started driving. Little new face. That's enough barking. You're alright. Carry on like your bloody home's up in a tree.